well then who was doing stuff and you know i'm sure there's some some truth to the story but uh they tell these like big stories like oh man the sf guys would come in from patrols blood everywhere and i'd be we'd be like id sergeant and they'd be like f you open the gate and uh and i was like so what did you do like well we opened the gate there were green berets and i was like and deep down i was like man they kind of sound like assholes but i, I kind of want to be one of those assholes. like really you're just the master of the basics when you get out of the key course um and i was i don't know if i want to say disappointed but that was something that didn't meet my expectations i couldn't clear a room better than, than anywhere else you know i i had no i had no advanced skills yeah. Um, but you don't know this until you, and, but it's, it's, but it's perfect. You know, the longer I stayed in the group, the, the more I looked back and said, you know what, that, that is the right thing. You have to be the master of the basics because Safaric is coming. Yeah. Sodic is coming. Mm -hmm. Level two is coming. You know, dive school is coming. Like they, it, they, it takes, up. that's right. It takes so long to really to truly have all those skills and for them to truly be skills, that is the right way to do it. Otherwise, um, you'd have people that think they know something and don't, and they'd be dangerous, and, yeah. and we'd basically be SEALs then. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to Beyond the Break. Today I have Brent with me, guys. He is a former, well, I guess you're never really an ex-SF guy, right? He's a retired SF guy, retired um, a Delta Force operator. Uh, he's currently uh, out. He has his own um, a coffee company, guys, and I just wanted to bring him on, uh, have him tell his story, right, what he went through, how he got through selection, the Q course, uh, and also uh, um, Delta Force selection, and also OTC, and then spent 20 years running and gunning, right? I just want to bring him on, guys, have him tell you his story, um, and then we'll go from there. So, Brent, I appreciate you coming on, man. Absolutely, man. Thanks thanks for having me. It's it's, it's an honor. And like like I said before we start recording, uh, I'm, I'm a proud Green Beret, always will be, so I really enjoy doing this podcast. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Yeah, so if you don't mind, man, just give the audience a quick little uh, snippet about your upbringing, where you're from, how was upbringing for you, and how, you know, you uh, found out about the military and what pushed you to join? Uh, definitely not your kind of traditional story as far as I'd, I had no intention of uh, of joining the military. I grew up in a small town in Florida. Um, yes, there are small towns in Florida. <laughs> it's not it's not all Disney in Miami. And, uh, yeah, I just worked at you know, our local family business. And uh, that was that was all I intended to do in life. I mean, I was I was more than happy in being in a small town, and more than happy than working in a small in a in our family business. So nine eleven hit, changed everything. Um, not that we weren't a pro military family. You know, my dad had me watching you know Vietnam movies and you know documentaries. He loved that, and we went to air shows. So we were a very pro military family. Um, but definitely wasn't something I thought was in my uh, in my future. Uh, the nine eleven hit, and and everything changed. And really, what ended up being a, a constant driving force throughout my career, including which which was that decision, is I, I told myself, hey, I don't want to be seventy years old, look back at my life, and think, you know, when America got attacked and three thousand people died, you know, I could have done something, I did nothing. So I didn't want a life of regrets uh, and that, you know, once I kind of looked at that decision through that, that lens, it was an easy decision for me. And I said, yep, I'm not going to live a life of regrets. I'm 20 years old, um, but let's go. So I joined the National Guard because that's, I had a family friend whose dad was a CW4 in the National Guard. So I knew so little about the military. I couldn't have told you the difference between active army and the National Guard. <laughs> I just knew that guy wore a uniform to work and was in the army. Um, so I went to him and uh, he's the one who kind of pushed me to the national guard and was like, Hey, this is what you should do. You can serve your, you can, you know, you can serve your country, but it's not a full commitment. So if you don't like it, you don't feel like you've made a bad decision. And I was, I was just so gung ho. Um, 
you know, after 9-11, I was like, I don't care where, like, where can I serve? How can I do this? And so that's how I ended up going to the National Guard. Um, I'll just kind of finish that story about how I ended up in SF through there was uh, I, I realized pretty quick that I was an Air Defense National Guard, that the Taliban had no helicopters or fighter jets, and <laughs> my MOS was useless. Yeah. <laughs> um, so by the time AIT was done, I got to my unit. They had just got back from their first tour in Afghanistan, and uh, and I was excited to ask the guys um, and say, hey, what? Uh, how, how was combat like? Um, and they looked at me disgusted, and they were like, what are you talking about, Brent? Like, air defense, there's there's no use for us in Afghanistan. What do you think we did? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know anything. I'm, I'm <laughs> Private Tucker. And they're like, uh, we just guarded gates. That's all we did. And I'm and the realization, which was my my biggest fear, hit me. I was like, oh no, I've messed up. I'm I'm not gonna do anything I thought I, that I was gonna do or wanted to do. I will be an old man regretting that <laughs> that I joined the military but did nothing in the military. So I asked these guys, I was like, hey, uh, well then who was doing stuff? And you know, I'm sure there's some some truth to the story. But uh, they tell these like big stories like, oh, man, the SF guys would come in from patrols, blood everywhere. And I'd be we'd be like, ID sergeant. And they'd be like, F you open the gate. And uh, and I was like, so what did you do? Like, well, we opened the gate. There were Green Berets. <laughs> and I was like, and deep down, I was like, man, they kind of sound like assholes. But I, I kind of want to be one of those assholes. <laughs> and uh, and since, so that's what I did. <laughs> that's awesome I found out i found out there's a 20th group uh you know and uh, i wouldn't say the rest is history because i'm sure we'll talk about it mm -hmm. but that that's how i went from you know join the military why the national guard and then why uh sf national guard that was that was the process to it gotcha gotcha i tell you what man at such an early age being 20 and making that decision to to join uh, the military, that is definitely something that is lacking nowadays. You know what I mean? As far as, and I get it, it was different. We were at war, but it still takes a different type of individual, which is why we're fucking different it, to make that call at such an early age while everyone else is partying and having a good old time, you know? It, it does. And uh, I, and there's, there's, the, there's the, the, the dichotomy to that. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, people always say, hey, thank you for your service. Thank you so much for signing up after 9-11 that, you know, that, you know, that was, that was brave of you. And, and my rebuttal after years of service was looking back going, you know what, it, it took, it took a terrorist event for me to join the military. Like the true heroes were the guys that signed up, you know, early in, in 2001, who, mm -hmm. who cared so much about their country. It didn't take a massive event to, you know, to motivate them to, to join the military and that's a true statement still i mean that that is true um but yes it it is you know something commendable and, and different when you know your country's at war and you know that you know when you sign up you're going to war you're not just going to go play military and i really think i'll i'll call it my q course generation mm -hmm. really was some of the most solid guys because of why they joined and uh and those those guys you know it's funny we were in such a hurry to get through the q course because we thought we were going to miss war you know <laughs> and little did we know you know that 03 q course yeah was going to see more war mm -hmm. in the next 15 years than than any generation before us yeah i tell you what man like a lot of people would say like everyone that I've spoken to um, uh, within groups, like they, they like, yeah, we're all war junkies, right? So a lot of folks compare us to fucking sociopath. And as you're telling me this, I can't think of, man, how, how fucked up do we have to be to be so excited about war that we're trying to fucking speed ourselves through training just uh, so we could get some, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, it's, you know, that, and that, that didn't leave me. Cause you know, yeah, it's, you know, there's, there's that one, yeah, there's there's a saying, of course, everyone's heard is, you know, be careful what you wish for. 
Yeah. And, uh, but you know, I wish for war. I did. And I know that sounds weird and, and only people like us will hear that and be like, yeah, I, I, I get what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, and not only did I wish for war, I saw it and I loved it. Yeah. And I loved every deployment I was on, you know, and, and they weren't all good, you know, the good and the bad, but you know, the bad never outweighed the good. Yeah. And, um, one of the reasons I went to the unit is because in 09, I felt like the wars were starting to go away. They were definitely going away in Iraq. Um, it was getting harder to operate in, in Afghanistan the way we thought we should be able to. Um, and I, so I wanted to keep going to war and I wanted to keep going to war unabated. Yeah. So that's why I went to the unit. You know, that, well, one of many reasons, yeah. but that's, it was, it was a driving factor. Yeah. And I think, um, I've said this joke before and SF guys get this, but the siege of Sodaf, the unit should send a thank you card to siege of Sodaf because they drove more guys to the unit than any, <laughs> they were the best recruiting campaign. <laughs> you know, everyone, you know, we can't, we can't fight the enemy and the siege of Sodaf. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll, I'll go somewhere to just fight the enemy. And, and yeah. I loved it. <laughs> That's sure, pretty I'm, accurate. Man. And I'm sure every, Fine. every SF, every SF guy listening to this has deployed is shaking yep. their head going man isn't that that's a that's a that's a podcast all on its own yeah <laughs> so you're in the national guard and uh you decided that you want to go towards sf what was that process like for you how old were you like did you talk to a recruiter did you know what you were doing did you do some research how was that entire process yeah um you know uh the i i did as much research as i could i started reading books Mm -hmm. um uh i found uh, some man now i sound like the old guy uh but some people will remember the the ako white pages remember yeah. ako army knowledge online yeah <laughs> um i i went to the white pages and searched special forces uh to try to get a contact number because i had no i'm in the florida national guard I have no contact with any special forces unit. No one there has any contact with special forces units. So that's why I went was AKO white pages. Um, I found a, uh, um, I was a, uh, I found a number to, to a, a three twenty, which is a, a group just out of kind of a, a company out of North Florida. And I called and um, uh, I talked to a recruiter there who sounded about as, I couldn't sound any more less interested in me. Um, uh, he wasn't exactly excited about private Tucker uh, coming to special forces. And uh, he basically said, Hey man, well, you know, call me when you're a specialist. <laughs> Luckily just a, a few months later. Uh, and, and, and that other, that you're not good enough, you know, for me. And like that, how do I say this? I think we do too too much of a job trying to cater to people for recruiting. Mm -hmm. Show people you're a high standard. And you know, yeah. you don't have to come down to them. Make them come up to you, and you'll mm -hmm. you'll get the recruits you're looking for. Um, you know, so he he definitely didn't didn't cater to me or or coddle me. And uh, a couple months later, uh, uh, I wasn't expecting it, but I got promoted to specialist. And like the next day, I called him like, "Hey, I'm now specialist Tucker." <laughs> and uh he was like uh come, come up here and take a pt test like he couldn't sound any less excited again that uh that i'm bugging him again because i'm sure they see so many people come through and wash out um and he said you know uh bring a uniform bring pts uh you're gonna do we'll give you a ruck you do a pt test in a ruck and hey all all i knew was to soldier and be a good soldier. And I showed up with a backpack of PTs, but I showed up in starch uniform and polished boots. And again, I disgusted him. And he's like, what are you wearing? Are you going to ruck in that? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> uh, but so that's, that's how I, you know, and I did well, you know, I, I did a 300 PT test. Um, I'm not, I'm not bragging. I just think this is the the attitude most guys have. I don't mm -hmm. think I'm special in this aspect, but you know, even at the beginning, it, when I was going to basic, I never asked, "Hey, what's what's the minimum amount of pushups? You know, what's the what's the minimum two mile run I can get away with and pass?" I've only ever asked what the maximums were, 
Um, in fact, my recruiter, to go back to my, my original recruiter, no one's ever asked him that question. He only knew the minimums and he didn't even know what it took to, to score a 300 on the PT test. Um, and that just blew my mind. That just goes back to how I was raised and a good upbringing and why that's so important in a successful career for, for, for any human, you know, outside of your career choice. Um, so I showed up, you know, did a, uh, did a 300 PT test. Like I always do. That's just the standard. I knew he told me I was going to ruck. I had no idea. He didn't tell me how far. So I just started randomly rucking, you know, I, uh, and so I showed up, did well. They allowed me in, gave me a, you know, long story short, they ended up giving me a, a selection date and, you know, off to, off to the selection and the Q course I went. Nice. Nice. So how, how was selection for you? Cause at this point you're still pretty young, right? Uh, physically yeah. you're good yeah. to go, but did you do anything mentally for selection or did you just show up good soldier and all and fucking crush it? This is this, and this is where uh, National Guard SF will have a you know a little bit of a um, I think advantage. But we had guys. We called it the NQP. You, you now get brought into twentieth group, and you get assigned to their NQP program, the non qualified personnel. I think they call gotcha. it something different now. And there are guys in that program that have already gone to selection nice. and didn't make and didn't make it. <laughs> so um, they may not know what it takes to make it but they know what selections like. So you get to talk to those guys and be like, Hey, what did you do? And they get to kind of give you some, you know, some advice or some pointers or some, so you kind of know what you're getting into a selection. Um, the, uh, but because I was national guard, they had just started SOP C. Uh, nice. Do you remember SOP, the SOP C yeah. program? Yeah. It's still a thing. Yeah. Okay. So I went to the SOP C program first and that by far was one of the hardest things I may have ever done in the military. It, you know, this is O2 and, you know, guys were, you know, we had, we had some guys from the triple nickel that were just back from their first deployment. They weren't happy about training future green berets. <laughs> uh, you know, they're missing war. They were very unhappy and they had seen war. And so they had a very high standard Yeah, and SOP C sucked. I mean, it was, I mean, you just talk about, it was like, you're at a hell week. This is, it was like hell two weeks. I mean, they just messed with you for two weeks and their standards were so high. They, they had a lot of same standards as selection would have um, as far as the ruck distances, land nav and all that. Um, but their standards were higher than selection, which kills me with almost any pre-course pre scuba yeah. was, was damn near was really harder than pool week and dive school. So if you make these pre pre ranger was harder than phase one. Yeah. So if you make these pre courses harder than the regular course, and then you boast, oh look, we have a ninety five percent success rate. Of course you do. Yeah. Because you, you, it's out. harder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It may it, it drives me up a wall. You know. In fact, <laughs> how many people that could have made the regular standard did you keep out because you held a higher standard than than pre course? Yeah. Than, than than the actual course. Yeah. And this isn't me talking about lowering standards. Yeah. The course itself should, what I'm saying is the course itself should be the highest standard. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. So SOPSI sucked. Um, but the good news about that is once you, if you graduated SOPSI, you're, you're going to go crush selection. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, you're, you know, I was a 23 year old, you know, young, young man that was in the best shape of my life. You know, there wasn't uh I'll never forget the, I don't remember selection being insanely hard. Of course it was challenging, but uh, not to jump around, but I'll say the same thing about whether it be CAG selection or SF selection. It's a, it's a, it's a unknown distance, unknown time selection. So they're both the same in a lot of respects because you have to give a hundred percent at, at both selections. I don't know how far the run is. I don't know what the standard is. So I have to give a hundred percent of both and maybe I crushed SFAS and maybe I barely squeezed by West Virginia. I don't know, yeah. but to be honest with you, both of them felt a lot alike to me because you're giving a hundred percent of what you have. Yeah. Um, and that's all so, you really uh, do. Uh, but the Trek sucked the, <laughs> the, the Trek and, and we we're, we weren't on, I wasn't put on a very smart team uh, and what, Inclu including me because i didn't solve some of the problems <laughs> and we dragged 
we dragged that telephone pole like it was a plow for five <laughs> miles in the soft sand. And I'll never forget how painful that was. Oh my gosh. Oh, but, uh, but yeah, I, but you know, I, that, that was my process getting, you know, to selection and through selection. Yeah. And like I said, uh, you know, Sopsy was, was one of the, if you can get through that, when you get the selection, you're, yeah. you're, you're a machine at that point. I mean, oh, really, yeah. you really are. <laughs> What advice would you have for anybody looking at going to selection like right now as we record this podcast, having been to SFAS and also West Virginia? I, I, I don't know their intention when, you know, when people ask me, you know, uh, selection questions, but generally speaking, I didn't ask a lot of guys questions. You know, I just knew I, I'm just kind of one of those guys I'll figure it out for myself. And I don't know if some guys are looking for shortcuts or, you know, how to, how to, you know, game the system closer to them. Um, so uh, I don't, I don't really see the need, you know, for, for you to go out there, especially in today's day and age for you to go out there and start asking a whole bunch of people, mm -hmm. go look it up online. Yeah. Go be a self-starter. There's so much information out there. Be a quiet professional. Don't go around asking everyone, you know, look at me, I'm going to selection. I know there's two sides of that. Yes, if you know someone who's been there, why wouldn't you ask them? But the answer to passing all selections are simple. Show up in the best shape of your life, ruck. There's your answers. If you can ruck like a machine and you can score a, a 300 PT test on your worst day, you're, you know, the, it's uh, a lot of it. Here's the thing, and, and you'll, you'll understand this. I, I feel like I'm also insanely lucky in my career mm -hmm. i mean don't get me wrong you know people with a lot of preparation seem to have a little more luck than other people and i don't think that's a, a coincidence but if you think all the things we've done in our career that you didn't you know with a 60 pound rucksack in the middle of the night walking through a draw that you didn't step on something and tear your acl could happen to anyone yeah you're in phase two doing break contract, the uh, break contact drills with a 90 pound rucksack and that you don't, you know, plant, turn around and blow out your knee. Uh, it's, they're so, we had, we had guys drop from the Q course for, you know, taking off their clear lenses because it was fogging up and run into a twig in the middle of the night and, and hit their eye, you know, I mean, and it's, there's so many things that can go wrong. Um, so you, you have to be as healthy as possible, as strong as possible, just to also get through the, uh, the, the, the luck of it. You know? Yeah. I agree a hundred percent, man. Um, what MOS did you, uh, end up with and what language? Um, I, I got the MO, I got the, my second least favorite MOS, which was 18 echo. <laughs> <laughs> I I did not want that uh because they're nerds and uh so I had to be a nerd and I'm and I mean that in the best way I was one yeah um, I really didn't want to be an 18 delta um oh, yeah. Nobody and not because <laughs> and not because I thought there were nerds uh really uh because their Q course was so much longer mm -hmm. I was in a hurt I was in a hurry to get to war <laughs> um and I just and just medicine wasn't something I was yeah interested in like that's something you got to want you know yeah. oh, obviously yeah. oh, yeah. so i wanted to be a bravo or charlie so bad and uh it hurt my heart when they gave me echo um <laughs> and i already knew my language because i was already assigned to alpha 320 gotcha because in the national guard it's not like you can just be assigned anywhere like mm -hmm. active duty like you're gonna be assigned to someplace closest to your home to your home station or gotcha. to, your, to your home address gotcha and so uh, they supported seventh group. Um, so Spanish was, I already knew was going to be my language. Gotcha. Gotcha. How was your stay at the Q course? Any challenges there or was it, you know, um, easy peasy for you? It was, it was challenging. Phase, phase two, uh, you know, I'll, and I'll have to say what it is. I know the phases have changed. They, they switched yeah. it up a lot, but you know, when I, you know, phase one back then was selection. Phase mm -hmm. two was SUT. I phase two was challenging. It really was. It was a 45 day ranger school. Yeah. And, um, and I loved it. I loved the chat. That's what I showed up for. I wanted to be challenged. Um, and phase two definitely gave me that phase three was the, uh, technical phase, your MOS phase. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, you know, very challenging. You know, when I left phase three, I felt like I was one of the best 
radio guys, you know, in the world and could make communication for my ODA anywhere in the world. So it, it gave me that base. Um, Robin Sage phase four was great. It was, um, they definitely allowed you to be, cre you know, it's really the first time in the Q course, really, you got to act like a green beret and be yeah. creative and, and be a problem solver. And so I was, you know, uh, Robin Sage was, was a different type of, of challenging. Um, and, and at that time it was very stressful. A lot of it was <laughs> self-induced stress because at that time you would get your green beret after Robin Sage. Oh, gotcha. But you wouldn't get your long tab until you went to language school, phase five, and then seer phase six. So at that time you were walking around as a green beret with no, with no, with no long tab. Um, uh, which was cool. It was great, you know, yeah. to, to, to do that much work and get a little bit of, uh, of, reward, uh, yeah. of a reward of actually wearing the green beret that you've coveted for a year now. Um, so it was, it was challenging, but some of it was, may have been my own expectations and, you know, other green berets would have to, you know, as I say this, you know, I, I don't know if they'll agree or maybe they didn't have the expectations I did. I was the master of the basics. I was the master of the basics, mm -hmm. but I wasn't the killer that I, you know, so to speak, yeah. that I thought I was going to be coming out of the Q course. Yeah. Like really you're just the master of the basics when you get out of the Q course. Um, and I was, I don't know if I want to say disappointed, but that was something that didn't meet my expectations. I couldn't clear a room better than, <laughs> than anywhere else. You know, I, I had no, I had no advanced skills. Yeah. Um, but you don't know this until you, and, but it's, it's, but it's perfect. You know, the longer I stayed in group, the the more I looked back and said, you know what, that that is the right thing. You have to be the master of the basics because Safawak is coming, yep. Sodic is coming, mm -hmm. level two is coming, you know, dive school is coming. Like they it they they, it takes up. that's right. It takes so long to really to truly have all those skills and for them to truly be skills. That is the right way to do it. Otherwise, um, You'd have people that think they know something and don't, and they'd be dangerous. And, yeah. and we'd basically be SEALs then. Yeah. <laughs> no All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'll, that'll, that'll rouse someone up. That was a yeah. joke yeah. for the most part. But they do that for a reason, though, because, and I would always tell my um, students whenever I was at SWIC that, hey, you know, once you graduate the Q course, you, You've gotten the basics down. Now the real learning starts when you yes. see your team. Because then yes, you're absolutely. being customized for that specific team, whether it's a Halo team or a dive team or a mountain team. They're going to yes. mold you into what they want you to be, right? We can't send you in there already molded, and now you re you really can't fit anywhere, right? Right. got to yeah. show up with the basics, and then yeah. they'll make you what they want you to be. And and even towards you at – yeah. At the end of my career, 20 years later, um, I, I still stand by this statement. You know, the, the Special Forces ODA is one of the most lethal combat effective units in the whole military arsenal. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing you have to let them do is, like kind of we already talked about, is let them work. Let them unsupervised, just give them, give them the, uh, uh, let them know your intent mm -hmm. and what outcome you want and leave them alone. Yeah. And they'll and, they, and they'll meet it. Dude, I tell you, man, like some of the shit that I've seen develop as far as mission planning and just executing on the ground when I was on a team just blows my mind. Some of the stuff that I would have never thought of as an individual, we all come together and we start mission planning and the Bravos are doing their thing and we hit an objective. And I'm like, holy fuck, like how did we come up with this fucking plan? I it's unconventional as fuck, you know? It's it's not that um uh I didn't appreciate it at the time I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at the end of the day, it's just more fun. All of us would prefer in one aspect to just have a mission come given to you, helicopters are outside, go hit it. That's fun. You know, that's that's what I did for the last 10 years of my life. Um, but I don't think people realize how much work an ODA puts into a single target. Yep. They own that target from start to finish. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they developed the Intel. 
they develop the complete plan. It's usually a complex plan because they don't have the assets that a tier one unit has. So they're having to figure out what to do with what we have. And then, you know, all the way through the SSE and post-op story building, your storyboard uh, building. And then before that, the 40 page con op that it eventually yeah. took you out the door. The ODA owns all that. No one's doing any of that for us. And it, and it, and it's, it was bittersweet. It's great because we owned it all. Um, it sucked because we had to do it all. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, when you go into, into course of action development and, you know, you have 12 guys that break up into, you know, three different teams and come up with, you know, a different course of action, you come up with some great plans. Dude, you know, was, and, and, yeah. and, and as you know, normally not any one course of action wins it. What you end up doing is like, you know, I really liked your infill. I liked your actions on, you know, I, I liked how, how you did this part. And then you actually get the best plan piecing together, you know, different parts and pieces from the course of action development process. Yeah. But man, yeah, I, I consider myself a pretty smart guy and I love mission planning. I, I, I consider myself a problem solver and I don't know how many times I came up with, my other, well, this is the best plan we got. Like, this is all we, we can do with what we have. And then hear another guy's course of action and go, damn, I didn't think of that. That's yeah. that, that was, that's that, that, yeah, he's right. That's the best way to get in there, you know, and being able to see that is, is extraordinary. Yeah. It's amazing, man. Cause I don't know if you had any crazy, you know, smart dudes in your Q course um, class, but dude, in my class, we had a fucking rocket scientist. Like we've had like movie stars. We have fucking politicians yeah. and they all just wanted that's to crazy. do their part after 9-11. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it was just crazy amount of smart dudes that were coming yeah. together on a team, dudes that you would have never thought of, you know, that's who they were until they opened their mouth. And I remember this vividly because we were in class and, you know, the 18 Charlie instructor, you know, cause it's math heavy, they were doing something on the board. And one of the students, he was like, Hey, Sergeant, that's, that's not correct. And, uh, and the instructor turned around, he's like, what are you a fucking rocket scientist? And he goes, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. I am. <laughs> that, was so that was the funniest thing ever, man. We we all just kind of looked around like, oh shit, he's not gonna make it. But he ended up going all the way through. So that was we. That was pretty amazing. <laughs> we had this medic on our team that I used to always love give a hard time to, and 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 in the best way. He ended up being, I think, he's a CW three and uh and third group right now. Um, we'll just we'll just uh say, Mark D. We'll just say yeah. his name is that. And he was the smartest, smartest guy I've ever met. But he's also the dumbest guy I've ever met. And I don't know if you've never met someone like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the type of guy who during, like, you know, uh, mission planning would say something. I'm like, that wouldn't work. And and I'm offended that you would even say that out loud and think that would work. That's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. And he's the same guy who will come to, you know, to to mission planning, you know, three missions later and as i'm looking at something that we want to do later you know he's like hey you know i'm staring at this problem for an hour and look over my shoulder and like, hey what, what are you working on and i'll tell him why i can't figure this out this is something we're looking at doing and he's he looks at the problem for like 15 seconds and goes well, it's easy why don't you just do this and it's the perfect answer <laughs> i'm like and it's the same guy who will give you the worst answer that will never work yeah. That will also solve the problem you've been looking at for an hour and 15 seconds. Oh, man. Uh, and, th and those are the type of guys you get on, you know, on an ODA. It's, yeah. I, I loved it. I Characters. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Some of the funniest guys. I've, uh -huh. uh, I'm still on group threads with my old ODA that are more active than than uh, teammates I had in, at the unit. That's awesome, man. It's, yeah. it's that brotherhood and that it, fucking camaraderie that it never goes away even I, right. shit, I retired five months ago some some of the guys were retired before me and we're still on you know like fucking threads together like we meet up for lunch once a fucking month like it's it it, it never goes away man it's it's amazing I, I can go back to you know to to the q course i still have four or five guys from the q course that no now we're all over the country don't get yeah. together very often and don't even text very often but but we do and if any one of those guys were ever like, Brent, I need you, I'd be on a plane that night without even yeah. asking them why. Like, that's how close you get to guys yeah. as, as early on as a Q course and then uh, on an ODA. Yeah, that's amazing, man. So now it's you finish the Q course, you get to your unit, and now you, you 
you're finally getting to go to war, right? So how was that for you? Like, did you, did it meet your expectations? Um, like, yes. How did it, that it, Um, I wanted to get to war so bad. Uh, I strapped hang with 220, 2nd Battalion, 20th group, because they were next in the hopper. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I, I, I got to go. Um, they, and I, we had a great deployment. It was Oh four Oh five. Um, Afghanistan was, you know, was, was, was a hot spot. We got put in a very good place in the South working out of Kandahar. Nice. Um, we, we had some, uh, really, really good missions. Um, uh, I had a great team, you know, that at that time that had all deployed before me which so not a lot of people had multiple deployments at that time. So the fact they had already been to Afghanistan before, um, was, was, was great. Uh, and, um, yeah, war, war was, was what I was hoping that it would, it would be, to be honest with you. And, you know, an ODA and the, the leeway we had at that time. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, if, if an ODA isn't complaining, then they're not happy. So no, it, it wasn't perfect. You know, there were still plenty of problems. Uh, but of course, when you get to look back to see how much worse it got, it was, it was, it was, it was a, it was a great time. We had plenty of leeway. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, um, looking back at your career, like, would you have changed anything at that point in your uh, uh, career? Like while you're down in Kendall Hall, would you have done anything prior to differently or did everything go exactly according to plan? I think I, I everything went as good as you know. You, I can always you know wish and hope, and with hindsight, you know, made things better. But given the information I had, you know, and and the abilities I had at the time, um, it was I don't really have any regrets from that deployment. Um, one thing that I think was really a, an asset was I read as many. There weren't a whole lot at the time, but there are already a few special operation books uh, out there. Um, and uh of 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 afghanistan Mm -hmm. um and i i read every single special operations book i could read from vietnam forward and you know now looking back after being in war and three different you know aos from iraq to afghanistan to syria um i do believe this uh so much of war regardless of regardless of the environment the country or even the era there's so much commonality in there yeah some things change there's always a, a you know some particulars of of every mission uh of every ao but generally speaking it's i don't think wars changed uh a, a whole lot you know in, in the last hundred years so reading those stories and getting to hear what guys had gone through before allows you to put yourself in that position and you know whether you know you do it or not you know subconsciously you know you you start going what would i do in that situation if i were ever in that situation what you know what what would that situation feel like but war gaming yeah that's right yeah and then when you then when you go to war you'll be you'll be in those situations it'll have its own uniqueness but uh there's so much similarities uh so read read books there's and 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 today there's so many more out there. Read them yeah. all. If you're a young Green Beret, if you're in the Q course, you want to go read books. And I don't care. And I read them all. I read SAS books. Um, I read Green Beret books. I read Navy SEAL books. Um, I read them all, and yeah. and all of them were were insightful to some degree. Yeah, that's some good advice, man. That's that's some really good advice because I can't remember. There's a concept out there. I the the name for it and the individual that that talked about it escapes me at the moment, but it's essentially just the uh, war gaming um, uh, 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 TTP, right? Like you put yourself in that situation and you you know walk yourself through different scenarios. Like, hey, I'm on this hilltop. Like, what what am I gonna do? Like, how do I maneuver? What's the saying? Like, every battle is 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 won before it even starts. So that's right. You know, just just putting yourself through that that mindset and, and actually yeah. start to war game and, and, and start playing it out. Right. That'll, you know, um, I guess I make mean, you a little bit more, more prepared and more lethal. Yeah. I, I, here, here's a, I think a, a, a pretty good, you know, uh, uh, comparison operation red wings. It yeah. was, it was, a, it was a, it was a massive, you know, it was a, tra- it was a, it was a tragedy. Uh, everyone will look at that and look at the book and look at the story and say, well, I wouldn't have done it this way. I'd do it this way. And I would have done this. And why'd they let him go? 
we can all do that because we've now put ourselves in that situation and we'd all deal with it wildly different than yeah. they dealt with it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I hate to quarterback a mission that went so wrong and cost people their lives, but I don't think, and I think it's easy to say that they ever imagined that scenario. It, it was kind of a one-off, you know, yeah. I understand why they didn't, but they got put in a scenario that they weren't ready for and they didn't make the best decision. Yeah. Which you will never make the best decision in a scenario that you've never thought of before. So I understand that. Um, but because of that was, you know, uh, such a high profile mission, there's no reason, there's no reason for special operations to ever make that mistake again. Because yeah. everyone should have heard that story. Everyone should say, hey, well, this is what I would do in that situation. Because that situation will come around again. Yeah. And it better have a different result. Yeah. And then we can say the same thing with the Tongo Tongo incident, right? Those guys uh, yeah. were put in that situation. And now that story will live on for. Because, dude, even after it happened, man, like I was at Swig, I'm I'm sitting in my desk. And it was a, a couple of days later. And my mind was spinning. Like I was wargaming it. I was like, man, yeah. if I was the team so right. if I was the senior guy on the ground, like how would I have reacted? Would I have, you know, dug in and fought? Like what would I have done? You know what I mean? So I'm wargaming it not, and I'm playing through scenarios. Right. right. Yeah, man. How about, yeah, speaking of anomalies, that was such an anomaly to have an yeah. overwhelming force attack an ODA in Africa. It just had never happened before. Yeah. yeah. But if it happened once, it's it yeah. can't, it, can, it yeah. can happen again. Yeah. Because And, and I hate to say it, our response to it was so was so weak. Yeah. Why wouldn't it happen again? Yeah. I they agree. got away with it. We oh, didn't yeah. do we yeah. didn't do anything to 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 show them that you don't kill a green berets in Africa. Yeah. And you will pay the price if you do. Yeah. That one. That one. Uh, I was at the unit at the time, but yeah. uh, that that one. That one really hurt me, a lot of us. It yeah. hurt a lot of us as as former Green Berets yeah. when that happened, and we didn't have a mission coming down the pipe shortly after that. And we're like, "Where's where's the mission?" Yeah. And having Green Beret friends, you know, in in the Fort Bragg area, looking at us and saying, "Hey, are are you leaving? What are you guys going to do about this?" Yeah, it, uh, yeah that it, one still it, it hurt me, man. Yeah, it's yeah, it was one of those things, and and even years after it happened, it's like, man, like. I bet you the guys on that continent will never make that mistake again. No. They yeah. will always fucking roll as yeah. heavy as and, they can and double and, prepare and, for it, you know? And I've watched the videos, like, you know, like I'm sure everyone else is. There's a great YouTube um, yeah. AAR on it that that shows the like, dots of the map and walks you through exactly what was happening. It's a great yeah. AAR. I'd, I would highly encourage anyone to go yeah. look at that, the Tonga Tonga AAR. And, um, uh, but those guys, yes, they made mistakes. But really, I mean, when you watch the way they maneuvered in the uh, in the, in the helmet the helmet cam videos, yeah. they move tactically. They move like like you know like their lives were in danger. They were yeah. moving with a purpose, you know. So they didn't. It's not. I don't think they did anything gravely wrong that yeah. anyone else couldn't have done at the same at the same time you know yeah. with again with the information they had and knowing this has never happened before why would they ever imagine that yeah i'm actually and I, and proud I noticed, of it man like the more I, I watch it the more i'm like man those dudes were like i i as a former green Beret, could not have asked anything better like i had my guys to my left and to my right and we're just getting after it right like and, we all fucking shoulder to shoulder like we're we're going the, after it until there's nothing else we could have done. You know. Again, that that can be another podcast, but I can uh, let let me get ahead of the comment section right now. Of you know, and what were they doing with short barrels in a long distance environment? What you know, the the eighteen alpha should have never moved with the maneuver with the maneuver element. The Zulu should have done it. He should have been back there with command and control. That the 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 people ask questions after questions. The, those are all things you can ask now and do looking back let me tell you if that 18 alpha would have moved through the uh you know that yeah as the the the, the ambush line with the base of fire and then think about it, the 18 alpha is the actual one out there on the maneuver element maneuver element he's he goes in there and smokes three or four guys because that's all that was initially in the wood line mm -hmm. he would have been he would have been the biggest name and hero 
and third group as the alpha that'll actually get out there and kill people. And everyone would have loved them, you know? So everyone, everyone second guesses it, but uh, I don't, I, I don't, I really yeah. don't. Yeah. Yeah. I don't either, man. Like I think those guys did a good job and they, 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 they fucking played the hand that they were yeah. dealt. And at the end of the day, like, Hey, they did their job. Right. And now we're fucking talking about it, learning from it. So it is what it is. And I'm um, also not sitting here saying that, that there aren't gross mistakes that yeah. I, you know, I'm not saying, well, you know, and applying that to everyone be like, you know, that's a gross mistake. And, you know, the guys on the ground are always right. No guys yeah. on the ground are wrong. And even in situations they've never been on that they can be wrong. And when I see that, I will call it out. Yeah. But I do give some, you know, the guys on the ground, some leeway that I don't think other people don't. And usually it's other people who haven't been on the ground and mm -hmm. been in those situations and yeah. they don't understand how hard it is. It's the man in the arena scenario. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and a lot of people don't understand, and I'm sure you haven't been there, you know, um, and me haven't been there. Dude, you can go in with the most fucking perfect plan. That shit never, ever plays out the way it's supposed to. It My, never does. <laughs> uh, again, there, there's always a balance, and I'm not yeah. saying don't plan. Uh, but what, what am I, one of my, my senior eight team Bravo on my, my first trip to Afghanistan gave me some of the best advice. Um, and we were over planning at some point we were over planning and, and you can, and he looked at me and he goes, Brent, you, do you, you know what a plan is, right? And I'm fresh out of the Q course. I'm thinking he wants like the textbook answer of, of, of what a, of what a plan is. I'm trying to think about it and give it to him. And he goes, Brent, uh, you're overthinking it. A plan is just a list of things that aren't going to happen when you hit the ground. <laughs> and I kind of chuckled at it. I was like, yeah, I can, I can, I can see with my limited experience, I can see how that's true. <laughs> and let me tell you, the more, the, the, the longer I was in this game, the truer that got. <laughs> so now having been the war and having, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen your share of trauma. What is your coping me um, me mechanism. How do you deal with trauma? Because I said, I'm sure you know about all the suicides. We experienced it on the Grimbury Arena and also uh, behind the fence, I'm sure. How have you been able to deal with uh, trauma and to make sure that you don't end up, you know, a fucking victim? You know what I mean? People aren't going to want to hear this, but this this is the truth. And maybe someone may, well, that's your truth, Brent. Well, may maybe it is. I signed up to go to war. What did you think you were going to see in war? Mm -hmm. What did you think war was? The Q course does a great job of every, you know, and, and SUT of putting a, a you know a, a dead teammate on the ground and saying, carry his body to a helicopter. It's five clicks away. And then and then the whole time telling you, you will do this, you will see this, you will carry your teammate dead to a helicopter. So when I saw it, to be honest with you, the first thing I thought is that's that's what they told me I was going to see. You know, I, of course, as you know, like, you know, when, when it happens in the heat of it, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, it's just something that happened and, you know, you'll deal with it when you can. You know, and the, the hardest time is that night, you know, when you get back and you have time to yourself and you have time to think about it. Stay busy. Stay busy. There's yeah. nothing you can do about it. You can't change it. We all decided to do a dangerous profession. Again. What did you think war was? So I I didn't have a problem with PTSD. 20 years, most of that in war, half of that as a Green Beret, half of that in the Delta Force. I could sit here and tell you a bunch of sad stories, but it's what I expected and it's what I got. And yeah. so I, I deal with it. It didn't disappoint. It. <laughs> it, it didn't disappoint. And uh, I, 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 I put the best way I can describe it is I, I take it, I put it in a little box. And I put it in the back of my head and I go to work. Yeah. And then, you know, once a year on the anniversary of that guy's death, you know, I, I, I go looking for it and I bring it back, you know, and I have a drink, you know, and I might call a buddy. We might tell a funny story and we might cry over it. Yeah. And the next day I put it back in that box. I put it back in, in the back of my mind and I go to work and I get busy. Um, you know, what, one of my favorite sayings, it, it's either six feet forward or six feet under. Those are the only two options you got, guys. So I choose to go six feet forward. 
That's an awesome answer, man. That's actually pretty cool. Um, so now how did that transitioning to the unit work out? Like what prompted you to go over there? I know you mentioned it was the lack of action on the CJ Soda part back in 09, but how did all of that develop? Yeah. Um, Part of it was that, you know, so we'll rehash that answer. The siege of Sodaf was, was a driving factor. But the other thing that was a driving factor was something else I had mentioned earlier back when I decided, you know, to to even join the Army. And what drove me to join Special Forces is the same thing that drove me to join the Delta Force, which was I thought I was good enough. I, I didn't know if I was good enough, but I was going to let them make that call if I was good enough or not. And I knew... I wouldn't be 70 years old looking back going, I wonder how far it could have gone. Like I didn't want to live a life of any regrets. So I did the same thing I did for basic training, the same thing I did for the Q course, the same thing I did for dive school. And I trained up, you know, I, you know, I showed up giving myself my, you know, my the best chance of success and just let, let the, let the cards fall uh, where they do. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's what, that's what, and, the other part was being a little bit of a warmonger and just wanting to see more of war. I wasn't, I wasn't done with it. I just, I just wasn't, I wasn't done with war. And um, so given like all those factors made it an easy answer for me that I, I have to at least go to selection and try. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, do you have to do anything mentally for what you were going to face or were you just there already as far as, Hey, I'm going to go give it a hundred percent. Like mental I've, challenges, not really. I'm gonna give it a hundred percent, but this is this is the mindset that's got me that's got me through everything. Mm-hmm. And and then trust me, I, I'm in my 40s now, so I'm 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 not the same person I was as a 20 year old Green Beret, and nor sh- you know, and nor should you be. Yeah, but I, I was I was a some people would say cocky, I'd say confident Green Beret, and I was more than happy to prove it to you. So, um, so. But I never thought I was the best. I I knew I was good. I never thought I was the best. So anywhere I showed up, and I don't care where it was, again, that whole list of places I've been in the military, I always showed up not thinking I was the best, but I knew I wasn't the worst. And I didn't let anything stress me out until I looked around and thought, hold on, maybe I'm maybe I'm the worst here, and I might be the <laughs> next one to get cut. I think so many people, so much, and especially with eight type personalities like we are, we put so most of the stress we put on, we put on ourselves. Mm-hmm. We put it on ourselves. So that was my way to deal with the internals of stress is I didn't show up having to be the best anywhere I went. I knew I was good, but I, but I what I did know is I wasn't the worst. And so, you know, I showed up even at West Virginia looking around. Um, it sounds shallow, but we all do it. Yeah. Looking oh, yeah. at that guy and be like, yeah. nah, that, that guy won't be here long. That guy won't be here long. You know, I, I ran next to him on the PT test and, you know, I'm way faster than him. You know, you size each other up and yeah. as, it, as everyone can, as, as the numbers got smaller and smaller and smaller and even down to tiny, Hey, as long as I could look and point to one or two guys that I was like, they'll go before <laughs> I go. My stress was, you know, that's how I handled stress. Yeah, <laughs> that's all. Hey, hey, that's a good strategy, it's, right? It's a, it's a, te- hey, it's a technique. It. it worked. Right, yeah. yeah. It's a yeah, technique. It worked for it. me. <laughs> so now you get done with selection, you go to OTC, and then you go to the unit. But how long were you there for before you decided to uh, retire? And what led to that? Um, I, You know, I'd... I don't, other than gen, generally speak, I don't talk a lot about, you know, selection and, and OTC yeah. for, for good reason. I appreciate you not prying, but this is what I do want to say about those two courses. Both of them met for the first time, really, of sorts. Training courses, I should say, met my expectation. Mm-hmm. Selection is the most professional run course you'll ever go to, bar none. It is the most professional run course you'll ever go to. Um, OTC was also very professionally run and the things they allowed us to do, you know, the resources is what you think it is. The training is what you think it is. It was challenging in, in, in every aspect. Um, when you get done with OTC, like, you, you know, unlike the Q course, again, it's, they're, they're two different animals. You're the master of the basics, you know, at, after the Q course, and you're not necessarily ready 
to go to an ODA and deploy and, and be an equal with those guys. Mm -hmm. You're just not like, and um, now when I got done with OTC, I'm not saying I showed up to a team and I was an equal with those guys, but by no means, but I knew I belonged there. I knew I could do the job at least to the lowest level of satisfaction required of me. So you leave that place really, really good at, at your job at, at an advanced level. So I really appreciated that uh, about it. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, like everyone, I, you know, I started out as, as an assaulter, uh, did that job for, for many rotations uh, towards the middle end of my career. Uh, I went over to recce. Um, and uh, even, even as a recce guy, you still operate as an assaulter. Now you just got one more thing you have to be good at. Um, so I deployed as an assaulter through the recce element several more times, including, you know, several back-to-back -back rotations uh, out in Syria. And I loved it. I absolutely love my time in the unit. It's a very different animal. Um, there's a lot of stress there in the unit that you could that that you kind of don't have an SF. You can be fired at any time of the unit, and they don't care how long you've been there. They don't care what you did. They don't care what you're gonna do. They just care what you can do now, and they will fire you. Um, and that type of stress, like you do, you live with real not self-induced stress you live with real stress for 10 years yeah you know or for as long as you're there just the constant expectation of being the world's best being ready to go at a moment's notice and being on a no-fail mission is just exhausting it, it it really is and as much as everyone can hate swick and hate going to swick um at the end of the day swick is a time to reset at least for two years you know, your family life, your, 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 your mental health, your, you know, everything about you. And, um, being from 20th group, obviously I, I got, I got no swick time. I went from being a guard bum that just volunteered to go into combat to combat school to school. I turned it into a full-time job. I go to the unit, you know, I, I'm there for 10 years. I, I got no break, nor was I asking for a break. Um, but I'm just saying it's not there. And when you retire, uh it, you, you retire knowing that you've you've given everything like it just it does you're you're, you're broken physically you're a changed man mentally like i i just and like everyone is a change you know everyone goes through change at that point but i just remember going to otc with some of the funniest guys you know i've i've ever met in my life and then you know 10 years later looking at them as team leaders just being grumpy you know not smiling a lot people and, uh, and, and I know why that happens. So yeah. it just, it, it, you give everything and, and they don't even hide it. They don't hide it at the unit one bit. They will tell you from day one, the unit will take everything from you and will, and is not required to give back anything. You will give more to this unit than it will ever give to you. And that's what it, that's what it takes for this unit to be what it is. Yeah. And it's, and it's the truth. So I, when I, when I retired, um, I think it was on my third trip to Syria and it just hit me. You know, I just, uh, I came back and I was like, I'm done. Like I've, you know, um, which is crazy. Cause the, the trip right before that, you know, I, I, I was still as, as, as big as a war junkie as I was when I was 25, I loved it. And nothing, nothing that anything necessarily happened that trip that made it, made that happen. I I just, I was just done and, and I knew it. So really it made the, the, the retire, the, the decision to retire pretty easy. Um, there's a lot of other factors. I had four kids, um, you know, getting married and four kids will, will, will change the the way you do things. And every deployment felt longer and longer. Um, even though they're only four months, uh, you know, well, they're, they vary, but you know, even though they're shorter deployments or reasonable deployments, we'll call it, um, the, Hey, here, here's, here's something that I don't think people, you know, realize unless you've been doing it for a while. It would in 03, 04, 05, I called I called home maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks. Yeah. When you pulled out the iridium phone, mm -hmm. you were detached and it's a good thing. Yeah. Um fast forward to 2018, you know, my seven-year-old daughter can call and FaceTime me anytime she wants. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's awesome. It's awesome to see your daughter on a FaceTime call, but it, there's a, you need to be detached, you know, working in that environment mm -hmm. and you feel bad when you know you could see your daughter every day. And when you choose not to, or the days you choose not to, um, but having that, you know, ability to communicate with family a lot more makes it, you know, adds to that, you know, that, that missing and that, and, and that stress. Um, and on top of that, you know, we, we lose a lot of guys in the unit. We do. I say a lot, you know, at, at, like in a unit, we're still, we're still losing guys, you know, when, when we go over and, uh, and, and it hurts. And my kids have been to more funerals than, than, than kids should have to go to. And so I think, I think the family part of that was a lot to say, not only am I physically done, you know, I think, I think now I've dragged my family through this as well. What else do you want? You know, you're on your, I got, I got to experience three different, you know, wars. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, it just felt like it was a good end cap uh, to my career. So it's an easy decision. Think, yeah. I don't think any generations, any other generation will ever be able to say that. Like the closest might've been the guys that were in Vietnam that also got to see Desert Storm and also um, uh, whatever s other small conflicts were going on. But our generation, literally, Iraq, Afghanistan, like literally, like fucking some of them yeah. at the same time, right? Because Afghanistan yeah. was still going on while oh. Syria was still popping off, my, you know? My, my first trip to Afghanistan, my actual team, uh, got moved their deployment got moved up and went to Iraq and as a single green beret I'm thinking 24 25 at this time uh I left Afghanistan I left Afghanistan and went straight to Syria and met my team over there and in fact my first night in country maybe my set my second night my first night I had to go out up to the to to the fire base my second night in country were uh were in Saddam's one of Saddam's old palaces Planning, planning a company wide hit of five ODAs hitting simultaneous targets, you know, the, that night. Yeah. Um, I mean, just, I mean, just stories and a, and a career that anyone else would, you know, would have died for in the, uh, in the nineties, you know, to go to Afghanistan war, right to Iraq, a whole nother war and on a hit, you know, your first night with your team. I mean, just, yeah. it didn't, it didn't get better than that. I mean, it really doesn't. We're spoiled, man. We're spoiled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we were. were spoiled. Yeah, yeah, we were spoiled. We really were, and uh, and I don't, I don't think a lot of people will, will, will understand, you know, that that mentality, and and that's okay. That's and and that's what makes the brotherhood, yeah, so special. Yeah, you know, really. I agree. Um, and so now, and hey, and here's another thing I, that and and you'll you'll know this too. We talk a lot, like, and not to you know talk bad about us, but that every Green Beret is a war junkie. And that's actually not true. There were plenty of Green Berets that 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 saw war and didn't and didn't like what they saw, and other Green Berets saw war and couldn't get enough of it. Yeah. So just because you're a Green Beret or a SEAL or whatever, you know, that doesn't mean this is automatically your mentality. It's I feel like this mentality is still probably maybe not even be the majority, you know, of no. of the teams. Yeah. No, I I don't think it is. I think just like anywhere else or any other profession, you still have guys that 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 make the cut that think that that's what they want to do and then once they come face to face with it they realize that's not what they want to do and then you still have guys that that puts up with it but right they don't really want to be there right and then right. you have yeah. guys that are chasing it you know what i mean and can't get enough of yeah. it and right. that within itself is okay they just have to know how to manage it yeah so there's yep. Yeah. So there's different uh, levels. I think guys. Right. Are different right. Levels. Yeah. I agree with all that. And that first level you talked about are the guys that literally just wear, want to wear a green beret and put a yeah. long tab on their shoulder and walk around base and say, look at me, yeah. but they don't want anything to do with the the dirty work and war that comes with those, yeah. with those, uh, with those things. Yeah. And you can easily identify those guys. Normally within the first firefight, you're like, yeah, yeah. Like you're, and shit, I, you're gone. Yeah. 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 Uh, and when you talk about that cocky 25 year old Green Beret, uh, Brent, I had no problem telling those guys what I thought of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's a lot of people that loved me for that. And there's a lot of people that hated me for that. And that's okay. The people who loved me, I'd, I'd, I'd do anything for. Yeah. And the people who didn't like me, it's okay. I didn't like you either. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and that's the, it's just true. 
I, yeah. I really do. I think you have to be okay with not being liked by everybody, you know? And the other thing, your intentions for what you did that caused that have to be pure. Yeah. You know, they have to be the, the, the right motives, you know, to, to cause friction. But if, if, if the motives are right, I, I had no problem yeah. speaking my mind. Dude, I think if everybody likes you, then you don't have any fucking true. Then you don't stand for anything. Character. That's right. Then you don't stand for anything. Because that's, that's exactly correct. Because then you're just pleasing everybody around you. That's right. Everyone, believe it or not, they might smile to your face, but they're going to know that, hey, this is the guy yeah. that just fucking goes with anything anybody says, and they'll never take you seriously. At least yeah. with the other guys, you you know what you're going to get. right? You know, you know where they stand. Person, you're going to get fucking straight feedback. You like that's it right. Or, take it or leave it. This is what it is, right? You do whatever you want with it. That's so, right. Yeah, I agree with that a fucking hundred percent, man. Um, so now you're recently retired. Um, I'll ask you a couple of random questions and then we'll jump right into your uh, company that you started and then we'll go from there. Um, so when it comes to leadership, having been a Green Beret and then also having been um, a tier one operator, what is your leadership philosophy? My leadership philosophy is a, a little bit like my PTSD philosophy. It's, it's, it's just straightforward, and some people aren't going to want to hear it. You're either a leader or you're not. Not yeah. every Green Beret is a leader. Not every Delta Force operator is a leader. And there's no school that you can go to that's going to make you a leader. And corporate America, mil, you know, the military, they're enamored and consumed by this leadership. How do we make leaders? How do we make be better leaders? You're either a leader or you're not. I'm not saying we can't make, you know, let's say a leader is from you know, a zero to 10 scale. I'm not saying we can't make a leader that's an eight, a nine. But if you're a three and you're not a good leader, you will never be an eight or nine. You're just not wired for that. So I hate the thought that if you just stay, stay in long enough, you'll make the rank and you'll be a leader. That's just not true. Yeah. And the biggest... um and it's not always true, but the biggest indicator for leadership is performance at your lower job. So, um, if you weren't if you weren't good at uh, at being it, through the ranks, if you weren't good at being a junior echo, you're probably not going to be a good junior echo, a senior echo. Mm -hmm. If you're not a good senior echo, you're probably not going to be a good team sergeant. And I can and I can go work that all the way up. Yeah. And the problem is we we get people in leadership that weren't good at the lower levels, and now we expect them to be good leaders. They, they were never good. Yeah. So picking high performers to be in leadership is, is my, is my, it's my leadership, uh, you know, motto, if you will. Cause if you weren't good at your job, how, how, how are they going to respect you? How are you going to tell someone the job you expect them to do and the standard you expect them to uphold when you didn't uphold it yourself? I so, agree. yeah, I agree. So it's that simple. You got it or you don't. And uh and I'm and I'm sorry if you don't, but they're <laughs> there, but I still have a you're not useless. I still have a job for you. Yeah. And I'm sorry that it's gonna hurt your feelings because you really wanted to be a leader more than anything else. Yeah. But for the good of this unit, you won't be. Yeah. And I think that's something that the army does wrong, right? <laughs> oh, really and, wrong. Uh, uh, again, we love this God's army, right? It's 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 done plenty for me. But I think the model that it uses, especially when it comes to officers. It's like you have a degree, bam, you're a leader. And I'm like, no, this dude just fucking wasted his life for four years in college drinking and and chasing skirt. And he graduated right. and now he's a lieutenant in charge of 30 fucking lives. So we're using that that model of, hey, you check the block, you're a leader. Now you have a lieutenant right. who's lost his shit and he's leading, you know, right. and, and that's that I think that is so fucked up, man. Like me personally it's, fuck around and put me in charge like we're we're gonna go to police standards to where hey you earn every fucking thing once you absolutely get five e6 then we can think about commissioning you because now yes. you have a track record right a proven record now you can lead as an officer this business of hey you come in right right out of college and bam you're in charge we're forcing leadership on people and now those folks are going to go through the ranks kissing ass Right. And right. Then they're going to be fucking generals one day. You know I'm, what I mean? And that's what's wrong with this whole system. I, I don't want to make it political, but I, I'll stand by this by by this statement. 
we have some of the most liberal all colleges are are absolutely liberal and the liberal mindset does not translate well to the military and so we have indoctrinated college graduates who spent four years learning everything that's really learning nothing to do about the military and in some degree this is a true statement learning how horrible their country is and we're saying and now this is the guy that should be in leadership role Mm -hmm. for four years he learned nothing about the military generally speaking that wasn't his focus in training. If you went to ROTC, your focus was your was your degree. You know, not you know not not the two weeks in the summer you spent, uh, you know, doing your summer training, and all your teachers told you how horrible of a country you're about to serve. And we think we're going to get great leaders that way. Yeah. I completely agree with 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 what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another thing that I have a really big problem with, and I think this is was pushed from officers. Can't prove that. It's an opinion. We've also pushed college education on the NCO core, and it's hard to get promoted without proving that you're trying to, you know, chase a degree or get college credits towards your promotion points. Yep. I don't care if you went to a public speaking class. I wish you'd have spent that time going to sniper school. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you have a degree, you know, if you if you went to a course in economics. I wish you'd have gone to sapper school. All these military schools are directly in line with military training and military uh, advancement. Why would we, why would we put, and unless you've gone to every military school possible, then you can go to college. Yeah. And I hate that that's somehow what we're pushing to the NCO Corps and promoting it over advanced schools. Yeah. Advanced military schools. Yeah. Cause that's exactly what, you know, especially with SF guys, in order to make it to like the E eight ranks, like you gotta have a, associates or a bachelors and guys. Of course, guys were getting it because that's what we needed to get promoted. But it was, you know, to the detriment of other things that they could have been doing to better I, the actual force. I got passed over for E eight twice. Yeah. And on my third look, I finally got promoted. And guess what I had done between my 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 second look and my third look? College. Yeah. I I I went to college and I wasted wasted hours away from my family and away from training in the Delta force trying to get promoted. Yeah. Yeah. Blows my mind, man. Blows um, my mind. Yeah. <laughs> blew my, blew my mind too. In yeah. fact, this is, this is how bad it was. Um, the second time I got passed over, I was in the hospital recovering from my seventh surgery after I'd got, sh- I got shot up in Afghanistan. Um, and, and, my arm didn't completely, I, I was back to, to work and kind of a light duty status, but wasn't completely healed up. And it wasn't, and it had some complications, had to go back in the surgery. So not only was I, I mean, the list, you know, halo dive, you know, halo jump master, dive supervisor, level one sniper, purple heart recipient, you know, valor awards. And they showed up in the hospital be like, yeah, but the army doesn't think you should be an E8. Like, what else did you want from me? Like, what else could I have done in the military to get promoted and got passed over twice until until I got some college under my belt? Yeah, apparently that's what they were looking for. That's crazy. <laughs> All right, Man. so now I'm moving. Yeah. I'm Just trying to talk about that stuff. I don't know why that stuff still upsets me. <laughs> and half of the shit you learned, you don't even fucking remember, man. Hey, the reason I brought up things like public speaking and economics specifically, because yeah. those are stupid courses I took <laughs> online at Fayetteville Tech, Fayetteville Tech Community College at FTCC yeah. to try to get promoted. <laughs> oh man. All right. Now moving on to another topic. What's 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 going on with you and Rob O'Neill, man? I see you guys beefing um on the <laughs> interweb about who really shot bin Laden. Do you remember when when um when that first happened, I think it was Rob Wiggle, which I love him, the fucking Marine. He had that oh, yeah. skit. Oh, the I shot Bin Laden skit? Yeah, yeah that's exactly who it is. It was is. epic, dude. <laughs> but well, yeah, I, I see yeah. you guys going back and forth. So what's uh, the whole story behind that? I uh and I'm sure there's you know some 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 followers you have that that weren't special operations, yeah. but um that statement you made, you know, or the statement I'm that I'm about to make to reinforce you just said that Rob O'Neill did not kill Bin Laden. Every one of every one of the guys in special operations will go, yeah, we all know that. 
And then I'm and something tells me everyone who's just you know is, is a fan of the special operations is gonna go, what? Yeah, yeah, what this is news to me. Um I uh I did a two net I did a two hour podcast. I'm, I'm a co-host on a podcast called the anti-hero podcast. Mm -hmm. And we and we did a two hour podcast breaking down the Rob O'Neill uh story. Uh Matt Bissonette wrote a book called Easy Day. Matt Bissonette did a 60 minute interview breaking down the mission he tells the same story that i've heard from seal team six members themselves that were on the mission that a team went in there and you know and and killed bin laden in fact i'll, I'll step back the point man shot bin laden as he looked in the doorway as they were moving up the stairs to the third floor the point man more you know is the one who killed him and then four guys move into that room and they all took security shots on him because as you enter the room, the guys on the ground, you still, you, you still shoot him. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's how it happened. Matt Bissonette, who was there, tells that story. Um, oddly enough, not always a, uh, a star witness, but the, uh, Bin Laden's wife, who was also in that room, gives an account in an interview about how his husband died, talks about how a team of Navy SEALs entered the room and killed him. So there's another, you know, eyewitness account and Matt Cole, an investigative reporter interviewed like 17 guys, uh, and all, you know, all, uh, gave the same, give the same story. So it's not, there's plenty of, uh, of open source information out there. Um, and then of course I went through his, his many interviews and showed how, uh, he, um, at times uh, tells different stories. His story kind of grows throughout the years. And then really just from a tier one operator aspect of being on hundreds of missions. Um, like, you know, when you hear a story and you're like, that's not right. That's not how it happens. Mm -hmm. That's not how, it, that's not what happens under NVGs. Um, if anyone here wants to know about it, it's episode 37 of the anti-hero podcast. It's two hours long. We'll put a get, link down below for him. Yeah. When you get done listening to that podcast, you'll you'll be more blown away that he got away with it. And some of the questions that people have would be like, "Who cares? Bin Laden's dead. Um, but, you know, it doesn't matter who killed him. It absolutely matters. That is stolen valor. He's saying he did something. He says that he was the only person in the room and single handedly shot Bin Laden in the face three times." while standing face to face with the world's deadliest leader and he and he alone did it and it wasn't a team effort when he wasn't the one who killed him uh, he was in the room he was probably the fourth person in that room but bin laden was was dead before before he even walked in and the man has made millions of dollars taking credit for something his teammates did and we should have a problem with that yeah l let me put it this way let's say you're a new england a new england patriots fan and Tom Bade, Tom Brady throws the game-winning touchdown in the Super Bowl, and this was the Super Bowl of missions for for special operations. Could you imagine what the country would do if the third-string quarterback came out publicly and was like, "I threw that touchdown," and Good then analogy. and then everybody was like, "Well, who cares who threw the touchdown? As long as the Patriots won the Super Bowl, America would go crazy calling this guy a liar, calling him a scumbag, call him, you know, you know." And and that and then he ends up taking credit for it and making millions of dollars for it and becomes the star of the Super Bowl that he didn't do. So yeah, it's a big deal and it should be a big deal to us as Americans and especially us as veterans. Yeah. So I agree with everything you're saying on your end, but to me, you know, since I started this whole social media campaign, like I, my my intent is to serve young men that that are yeah. looking for you know people to emulate right and in my eyes there's no greater um folks out there to emulate than people that serve whether it's military yeah. cops firefight like, yes like that's what i'm about fuck yeah. all the you know influencers that are shaking their ass or lifting fake weights or like i don't give a fuck about any of that right people they should be e emulating us because we're the ones that that's done something worth emulating. But when you're on the public stage and you're lying like that, then what you're doing is you're 
telling these young men that it's all right to do that. That's the problem that I have is you're, you're representing something that's bigger than yourself. And then you are just like no characters, no fucking morals, none of that. And you're just telling these young men who are very influential that it's okay to do that. You know what I mean? And, and that you could be rewarded for it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's a travesty. Yeah. That's, that's my issues with it. Right. And for the longest there, I fucking believed them, right? I didn't know any better. It's not my community. So I was like, hey, man, if he's out here doing it, he's got books, he's making all sorts of, like, it must be true. Now, in your opinion, like, why isn't anybody from his community policing him up? Oh, uh, I, I can answer that because when I was done with the podcast, all those guys I told you that I knew called me like, oh, man, that was awesome. You know, good, good job. That's, you, you nailed it. Everything you said was absolutely correct. Um. And, and what I would say to them is awesome. You know, I'm thinking about doing a follow on podcast. Uh, would, would you, would you be willing to to come on and say that? And they all go, no, nah, Brent, you know, I can't come on and say that. Here's, here's why. I can talk about that mission all day long. <laughs> Excuse me. I wasn't on the mission. It wasn't a Delta force mission. It It's the Delta force isn't going to come after me for talking about a mission that I wasn't on. So there will be no repercussion for me talking about it. It's the same reason I didn't come on here talking about Delta Force missions. Once I start talking about things that I was a part of, things that I shouldn't be talking about, they'll do what's called, it's called PNG, persona non grata. They will excommunicate me from the community, from the community. Now, what does that mean? It's not that big of a deal to some people. Some people could care less, but like PNG me, I don't care. Um, so like once a year, I can go back to the unit. And, uh, you know, when we have the, basically the old timers reunion and I, and I can, I can go back and hang out with the boys and I can go see the old, and I can see the old unit again. And, you know, if it's a big enough gathering or promotion ceremony for an old friend or a change of command ceremony for an old friend, I can still go back to the unit and be a part of those. When you're a PNG, you are not allowed back at any of the events. So by the way, Rob O'Neill is PNG from from seal team six yeah uh and uh anyone who anyone from their command talking about a mission they were on will be png and it's just not worth it to them they want to stay in good standings with, with, with what they call the command yeah and that's why that blows my mind man because he's probably blows like, my I'm mind gonna, too yeah it, he's because he's probably like fuck your png i got millions bitch exactly exactly you know I mean? and, and and there's there's a lot of things uh, I'll just talk about real quick. Again, I would say this could be a podcast again all on its own, but it has been. It was a two hour podcast. And I, don't, <laughs> I don't I don't, I don't want to drag anyone through that yeah. here. Um, but some of the arguments will be, well, um, you know, Rob O'Neill's book was approved by the Navy. That is true. Sure enough, was. And people don't understand that being approved by the DOD or the Department of Navy. They don't check for, they don't fact check. They don't look for accuracy of the book. They don't go and start asking all your teammates, hey, this is a story he gave. Is this true? The only thing they're reviewing for is revealing sens sensitive or classified information. And as long as you don't reveal any sensitive or classified information, you can say whatever you want in the book. That's their only job for approving a book. So when people come in and say, well, you know, his book was approved by the DOD, so it must be true. No. The only thing it must be is that it doesn't give away classified information. Yeah. That has nothing to do with the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. Now, what would you say to all the folks out there that are going to tell you, hey, this is not your community, you know, don't throw, you know, stone at a glass house and all that other bullshit. Because I'm like, I love giving my opinions about this type yeah. of stuff. Because again, if it's on social media and young men and women are looking at it, then there needs to be context to it, right? Like, hey, he's out here doing this. This is like uh, I'm in a community that is pretty yeah. similar to theirs. Like, Hey, this is what this means, right. From somebody that's, that's experienced some shit, right. Don't just take right. it for face value, add some context to it. Cause then if you don't, these young men and women are going to take it and they're going to fucking run with it. And that within itself is dangerous. This is what I'd say to them. And this is what, yeah, I don't think people understand about the tier one community. Um, at the end of the day, that is my community. And, I, and I'll, I'll tell you what that means. When I when I separated from the Green Berets, 
Green Berets can't come visit me at work. Green Berets, you know, generally speaking, you know, aren't coming to my in my compound overseas. But I tell you who can, other tier one operators, SEAL Team Six can. Mm -hmm. So it's it's yeah, you know, I it really doesn't get viewed really as uh you know their SEALs and you know and they're in the Navy and we're in the Army. It becomes a tier one community. It really does. So he is part of a tier one community that I was in, which is the smallest community in the military. So it, you know, when they say, well, it's, it's not your community, it absolutely is. And there is a tier one operator out there uh, shopping around stolen valor and profiting for, from it. And like I told you, I, I had no, I, my whole career, I've had no problem telling people uh, the truth. Yeah. And, and, and this is no difference. And I'm not out there trying to create drama for drama's sake. This has nothing to do with drama, has nothing to do with clicks. It has to do with righting wrongs. Uh, if and we, I won't go into it, but you know, we talked a little bit before mm -hmm. the show. There's plenty of topics I could cover for clicks that I don't because yeah. it doesn't meet my threshold yep. for what's good, for what's good for the community, for what's wholesome. Um, but this is just a straightforward, luckily, a straightforward um, topic that uh, that I don't have a problem. Yeah. speaking up about because it's true now do you think he'll ever come out and try to right this wrong or you think he's gonna write that shit to well I, well i guess it's already out right but i it's been a while since i've seen him anywhere as far as uh podcast but i know he's made the rounds quite a bit and profiting from it you think he'll ever write this wrong <laughs> no i invited uh, at the end of the podcast i i and if anyone watches the podcast and or or if you don't don't judge me and, and be like, oh, you know, and think you know how I did that podcast. I talked about that podcast. You know, Rob O'Neill is a hero. He's a war hero. Uh, he served, you know, the white side special operations, you know, combat deployment after combat deployment. He's a tier one operator. He did a lot of amazing things for this country. Um, but at the end of the day, all those things doesn't allow you to do what he did. Um, I did it in a very professional way. At the end, at the end of it, I I basically begged him, you can write this wrong. Like you don't have to go to bed every night feeling like you're a fake. You don't have to worry every day thinking, man, one day the truth is going to come out. Um, if he ever came out the truth, I told I'd even come out there. I'd stand beside you and give you a big hug afterwards. Mm -hmm. I won't even hold a grudge. People make mistakes. Yeah. Um, do I think he'll do it? Unfortunately, I don't. Do I think maybe some helmet cam footage may uh, finally come out one day and 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 prove differently? Uh, I I do. He'll it he'll he'll get proven one day that he was a liar. But it's too. But I don't think he'll care. He's he's made his millions. Yeah, bro. It just blows my mind, man. Because there's no situation or fucking environment that exists where I see anybody getting away with that. In SF, it's, or even in your, dude, that dude would probably get his ass beat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, it's, and I'm sure you know guys are thinking about it, but it it, it just blows my mind that it's gotten this far. You know yeah, what I mean? No. It just fucking blows my mind. But there's, anyways, there's a, go check there's out the a podcast. Reason, <laughs> yeah, there's a reason he has a podcast, and you won't see other SEAL Team Six members on his podcast. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm not shit. I'm not even gonna say the name of his. You and I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk offline about it. But I don't know who did. Um, I don't want that shit going over here. But um, no, I hear you. <laughs> right, uh, but yeah, <laughs> this blows my mind, man. But all right, so transitioning. So now you do have a company that you do run. Go ahead and tell me a little bit about that that company, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you the 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 origin of the company as as at, when I got out. Um, I had some other friends you know, from the unit that were training SWAT teams and uh, every, every now and again, they'd, they'd give me a call. Hey Brent, what are you doing? Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to go train this SWAT team uh, and I need a, I need an assistant instructor. There's more than we need another instructor where you'd be willing to do it. And so I said, yeah, it's, you know, sounded good to me. Um, I didn't expect SWAT teams to be funded like the Delta force. I'm not naive. You know, I had a, a an expectation of what I thought I was, you know, would see. Um, and some large, large city SWAT teams are, are, are very well funded. None of them are funded enough for what they do. You get into that community and you start seeing what SWAT teams do on a daily basis and uh, the experience they have. And you're like, man, these, these guys, 
need more resources, you know? Um, and, uh, and a lot of them, we, I'd sit, I'd start getting phone calls saying, Hey, Brent, uh, I heard you guys, you know, went over and trained this SWAT team. Would you be interested in training ours? And I'd give them the rate, you know, that, that a tier one instructor gets. And they'd be like, Oh, I mean, we can't afford that. Um, and I'd say, well, cut it in half. I don't care. Like once you start seeing the information I have, that is really useless at this, at this stage in my life, I have a, a massive amount of information of, on, on how to hunt bad people in the most effective way possible. And it's useless information to me right now. And if I can't give that to someone, you know, in law enforcement or SWAT teams, um, it's a tragedy. So I would, I said, cut, cut it in half. I, yeah, I need to give you this information. And they'd say, Hey, well, we're, we really, we have no budget this year. We're trying to fight for this training budget next year. Um, and for me to think that these, that this information that I think could be life-saving information to these guys, and I'm going to hold on to it for a whole year until they could get me money just didn't sit right with me. So I would tell them, I said, you know what, we'll talk about next year, next year. You, you give me a couch to sleep on and, uh, and some meals I'll, I'll fly out and train you. And uh, that happened time and time again. Um, at some point, uh, it happened so often. I was like, I, I, I can't keep doing this. You know, I'm, I'm buying the, the plane tickets, you know, and, and, and I'm turning down other paid gigs to, to do this, you know, no, no good deed goes unpunished. And then I was just trying to think, Hey, what can I do? What, you know, what, what can I do to, to help these guys out? Um, and, the, and, you know, I wanted to start a, my own business anyway, a uh, very entrepreneurial spirit. And I said, Hey, I'm going to start first responders coffee company. All these guys drink coffee. Mm -hmm. um, it's something, and, and it's something I can use to raise money to help, to help them with, with resources through my business. Um, and so that's, that's why I landed on that. And uh, about, we, we, it's a year old. We started November 22, uh, but maybe Three, four months ago, we launched cigars on top of that. So we also launched First Responder Cigar Company. Um, and and the cigars have been wildly uh, successful. We probably sell more cigars than we do coffee now, um, and uh, which has been great because the, the the more we grow and the more uh, um, the, the more I can give back to the first responder community. And that's that's where my heart's at right now. And uh, and uh, I'll and, uh, kind of wrap it up. I've said this before, and, and I mean it. As much as I did for my country and the and the great units I work for, if my family's in trouble tonight, the Delta Force isn't loading up little birds to come save us. SWAT teams are. Yeah. Uh, if if my kid gets hurt, it's you know it's an EMS, it's a firefighter. Those are the people who are are taking care of me now, and that's where my resources are going to go. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So where can people go to buy the coffee, to buy the cigar, if they're interested? Uh, frccoffee.com uh, and frccigars.com um, both funnel to the same website you know when we we sell our coffee and cigars uh, right there on online awesome yeah and what i'll do is i'll i'll put those websites and the link down below so folks gonna uh, uh, find it um, but with yeah. all that said if anybody wants to get a hold of you brent how can they get a hold of you i um i don't I monitor our social media uh, a lot. Uh, sometimes it takes me a little bit or, you know, our social media girl will, will usually tell me when I, when I have a message, but uh, 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 IG FRC coffee uh, at, at IG DM me. Um, and, uh, it, it, and the message will get to me. And, we, and I feel a lot of, I feel a lot of messages uh, via Instagram. And then they tell me to email them or call them. I've, I've had many of phone calls just with SWAT teams talking about shields, talking about situations. Uh, I feel those questions all the time and, and, and I love it. You know, it's, it's my way uh, to, to give back. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man. Um, oh, and, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me. me. Yeah. Oh, as soon yeah, as, as soon as I don't, I really don't know exactly where I ran across uh, the green Bray Chronicles, but as soon as I saw, I've had, I, I usually, you know, I have a lot of people reaching out to me for, for podcasts, but I reached out to, to you for this one. I said, Hey, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I want to get on this one. Cause yeah. like I said, uh, <laughs> of, of everything I did, I, I'm, yeah. I'm a, I'm a very proud green beret. I will always be grateful for the time I, I spent on the teams and uh, really enjoyed doing this one with you. Yeah. Yeah. Shit. And I'm happy to have you. Like I said, we don't have a lot of SF type podcasts out there, but uh, having you on means a lot, man. And I'm sure 
you know, the folks that are going through selection, the Q course, or even in group right now watching this is going to appreciate it. That'll motivate them to hopefully, you know, go try out for Delta or whatever, you know what I mean? Or start a business once they get out. Like there's endless fucking um, things that, that could come from this one. So I really- That's right. We, we need good men in Green Berets. We, yeah, we, we need good Green Berets to become good Delta Force operators. We, we need good businessmen that, yeah. that have a purpose with their business and, and can give back to the community. So I encourage anyone that's thinking about it to do that and to, not, and to live a life with no regrets. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it, man. Thanks, brother.